Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you today. The scripture reading, if you're following along in a worship guide, you'll see is from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 1 through 30. This is the first half of the David and Goliath story. 1 Samuel 17, 1 through 30. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah and Ephes Damim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. Also take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, What have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another, and spoke in the same way, and the people answered him again as before. This is God's word. The story of David and Goliath may be the most popular story in the Old Testament. And I think it stands out because it's memorable, it's certainly exciting, it is compelling, 
And because it stands out the way it does and it's been given so much attention over time, there are a number of different interpretations of the story of Goliath and David. And a lot of them are wrong. <laughs> Here's a wrong one. In the Western culture that we live, the story has all of a sudden become a metaphor for describing any underdog who beats the odds, right? So to this day, the movie Hoosiers is still one of my favorite movies. 1986, depicting the small town of Hickory, Indiana, and that very small school as that boys basketball team enters the Indiana State Championship against the much bigger Indiana State team. And they prevail, they win. It's a classic David versus Goliath story. Well, the story's not about that. It's a little bit about that, as we'll get to later. Here's another interpretation that I think is wrong. The author, Malcolm Gladwell, some of you may have heard his name. He's a writer, he's a speaker. He has a TED Talk called The Unheard Story of David and Goliath. It's on YouTube. It has almost five million views. He's a really good author. I've gifted some of his books to people. He tells a very good story. Unfortunately, he gets the whole thing wrong. He plays loose with the facts. He majors on minors. He leaves out details. He essentially makes up his own story, and he reverses the roles of David and Goliath. That's not how the story is told in Scripture. So if it's, if it's not about David and Goliath as this underdog story, and it's not about switching the roles, what is it about? Let me tell you. The people of God are in trouble. And look at some of the trouble they're in because of the giant Goliath. Look at verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. And then look at the further trouble that affects David's brother Eliab over in verse 28. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. The people of God are fearful. The people of God are angry. They're in trouble because of this giant. And David is the only one in the story willing to step in and do something about it. That's what the story's about. David steps in. And so let's think about that as we go through this uh, first part of the story today. Once again, let me set the scene for us. Between the coastlands on the Mediterranean Sea where the Philistines lived and the hill country of Israel where God's people lived in places like Jerusalem and Hebron lay a series of valleys called the Shephelah. In one of these valleys named Elah, and we read about that today, the Philistines and the Israelites have gathered to do battle. The Philistines standing on one side of the mountain that overlooked the valley and the Israelites standing on the other side, the opposite side. The Philistines have already created trouble in the lives of Israel. We read that they have overrun the town of Soko, which belonged to Judah. It was an Israelite town. So that tells us that likely some families from Israel have now been displaced, forced to move back farther into the hill country. It probably also implies that well water was no longer available for Israelite flocks. And perhaps now this has left a fear among the people of God wondering which town is going to fall next. We also read later on in the story that the standoff has lasted 40 days which may not seem like a big deal to us. But this is 40 days now that these men have been away from their families. This is 40 days now during the spring or summer season which, when warfare was fought that the men are missing out an opportunity to work the ground. They may not be able to feed their families in case, unless they get back. So this is some of the trouble that the narrator has listed for us. Not in this like stand-up front way, like we, we might expect, but it is certainly there in the narrative. And then, of course, there is the biggest problem of all, right? There is the giant Goliath. And as I said earlier, 
this giant has created, uh, verse 11 says, dismay and fear among the people of God. The biggest trouble facing Israel is this Philistine champion. He's a giant named Goliath. And I want you to see here how the text describes him because it's so important for our understanding. The writer of 1 Samuel, with his description of Goliath, means to leave on us an impression of this great, great trouble. If you noticed, there's quite a bit of ink spilled on describing Goliath, isn't there? Look again with me. Look at verse uh, 4. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. English equivalents are still kind of difficult to come by because we don't quite know the measurement system that's being used here. But most conservative estimates put Goliath at over nine feet tall. And then as we read on, verse five, he had a helmet of bronze on his head and he was armed with a coat of mail and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Again, conservative measurements would mean that the weight of this armor was about 125 pounds. And then as we continue to read in verse 6, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. That would be about 15 pounds. And the writer has spent time accumulating these facts to make this impression on us. Goliath physically is this imposing figure. And his ego is just as big, if not bigger. And he's got quite a mouth on him. Look at verse 10. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. The expectation on Goliath's part is clear. He's going to win. And so once again, the writer of 1 Samuel, and I would remind you, God's word God's word is careful to point out two things about Goliath. His outward appearance and his heart. Because his words reflect what is in his heart. And if you're following the story from 1 Samuel 16 that we looked at last week, and you're reading here in 1 Samuel 17, the people of God have an opportunity to respond, not with dismay and fear, but with joy and laughter. Verse 11 is not the right response from the people of God. Why is that? Because they're not looking at things from God's perspective. Nobody in the story at this point understands what God is saying. Because over in 1 Samuel 16, God made it very clear that he does not look on the outward appearance, but he looks on the heart. Back in 1 Samuel 16, when God is looking for a new king because he's rejected Saul, though Saul is tall, but his heart is evil, he comes to Jesse's first son, Eliab, who is tall and good-looking, but God judges his heart as evil. God does not look on the outward appearance. He is not impressed by the physical appearance. God looks on the heart. He knows it, whether it has adopted his values or whether it has rejected his values and is disobedient. Saul has been rejected because he doesn't measure up. Eliab has been rejected because he doesn't measure up. The writer is subtly telling us that Goliath, though he's tall and strong, he's got a bad heart. He's defying the people of God. He doesn't measure up. And like Saul was rejected and Eliab was rejected, Goliath will be rejected. The people of God should know that. But nobody in the story sees it. Nobody except David. And there is no faith in this story until David steps in 
Look down at verse 26. David says, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine? In other words, he doesn't participate in God's grace. He has no faith. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And David has done something very significant here. David, no doubt, is contrasting his God, who is alive, with the Philistine God, who is dead or has never been alive. He's just a block of wood. He has no animating power in the Philistine's life where our living God animates, gives us laughter, gives us joy, gives us hope. Nobody sees that until David steps into the story. That reference to a living God, that's David's faith coming out of his mouth, coming out of his heart. One commentator put it this way, David is asking essentially, doesn't having a living God make a difference in all this? What a great statement or question. Doesn't having a living God make a difference in all this? This is a gift to us today from our God. This is a faith statement. This is a statement that you can take into your week. The Israelites should have been taking this thought into their battle against Goliath. Remember earlier on, they had suffered the loss of land. They have a living God. Whatever loss that we might suffer this week, we have a living God. They were in danger of not being able to provide food for their families. They have a living God. Do you worry about providing for your family? Do you worry about your family making it? You have a living God. That's a faith statement to take with you this week. We have a living God. Sunday is not a time for dismay or great fear. Sunday is a time for confidence and laughter with our God. As we sit here, we ought to adopt the perspective of God, the one that he gives us in Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage? And those who gather against the Lord or against his anointed our God sits in the heavens and laughs. Today is a time of laughter. It's a time of joy. It's not a time of fear. It's not a time of dismay. All because David steps into the story. Everyone else in the community of God's people is impressed with the living Goliath. David is impressed with the living God. The living God who is holding on to his people. So I would remind you here in the first point at the end that as we meet as a community of God's people, it's a time for us to express our faith in the Lord and to hear from our God through his word. Secondly, fear and dismay is not the only emotion that David has to combat. He also has to combat the anger of his oldest brother, Eliab. And that's over starting in verse 28. Let me again try to help you through the story because it's important to listen to what the writer is saying. David hears Goliath's threat. And the men tell David what the king is willing to do for the man who strikes down Goliath. He will be made wealthy, he will be given the king's daughter in marriage, and his family will live free in the land, which means no taxes. Wouldn't that be a nice opportunity to have today? David is inquiring more and more about the details. That's what it means when he says David kept asking. He's trying to make sure he has all of his facts straight. This is what the king promised, this is what's going to happen. 
This is the deal, right? Right? He continues to ask that question as well as express his faith. And now when we get to verse 28, we have this rather strange reaction of Eliab given to us. The scriptures, again, are painting a picture of Eliab. I don't want you to miss that. We know from the previous chapter that Eliab is tall and he's handsome. But we know that God has rejected him because his heart is evil. And so whatever Eliab says here is bad. Sometimes we can come to a passage like this and read an interchange between an older brother and a younger brother and say, ah, that younger brother had it coming, didn't he? Some of you who are younger brothers know what it was like. You know, you're constantly poking at the older ones in the family, you know, and eventually you need to get stomped on. We might think that's what's going on here. That is not what's happening here in the story. Once again, because the writer won't let us come to that interpretation. The writer has already told us that Eliab has been rejected. So what he is now saying should be rejected. It should be seen as the wrong response to what David is saying. Eliab expresses anger. Maybe that anger comes from some jealousy. David has been appointed king and Eliab missed out. Maybe some of that anger comes from Eliab being mad at God. The text doesn't say, but he does have anger. And that anger leads to presumption. He presumes to tell David why he's, why, what's in his heart and why he's, why he's present. Because you just came to watch, to watch the battle. Eliab is full of self-confidence. And his anger and his presumption and his self-confidence has, has blinded him. Can you see that? The text says, Eliab is very clear. He says in verse, uh, ah, yeah, they're, they're in uh, 28. I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And so far in the story, David has said, I'm interested in participating in the battle. I want to step into the battle. I don't want to step away from it. And Eliab is blind to all this. He's blind to what David is offering. He, he doesn't understand. Again, as we look at the text, this is so important. It's vital for our understanding. Look once again at what is promised the man who strikes down the Philistine. This is over in verse 25. The men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David is looking at an opportunity here, not to get rich, okay, by himself, not to just get married and enjoy marriage by himself. He, he's not looking at forward of not paying taxes, all just for himself. That's not what he's doing. David is thinking of his family. If David benefits with riches, his family benefits with riches. If David marries into the royal family, then his family has an end to the royal court. If David is able to conquer Goliath, what happens? The whole family lives tax-free in the land, including Eliab. Eliab is blinded to David's generosity and his grace. David is saying, I want to step in. I want to help. I want to help you, Eliab. But Eliab does nothing but becomes angry. Nobody in the story can do what David is doing or is willing to do what David is doing. And we get to a, a text like this and we think, man, that's a pretty big burden to put on our shoulders this morning to live like David. 
you're identifying with the wrong characters. Oh, sure, there's some good examples that we can learn from David, right? You know, to be people who express our faith in God among the people of God. There's certainly some faith that leads to courage in David's life. Those are all good things. But the writer is asking us to identify with the people who are fearful and the people who are dismayed. And the writer is asking us to identify with those who are self-confident, to those who are presumptuous, to those who have become angry. What do we do? What happened in the story? David stepped in, and he is beginning to relieve the fear. And notice this about the anger. David could have so easily said, you're angry at me? Don't you see what I'm doing for you? Fine, handle it yourself, and goes back to the farm. But he doesn't. David doesn't step away. He steps in even deeper, as we'll see next week. David is a substitute in the story. And it's through a substitute that we're able to ultimately overcome our fears and our anger. David is obviously pointing to the greater substitute, Jesus Christ. Think how Christ has relieved your fear and your dismay. If you are in Christ, he has forgiven your sins. There's nothing now that you can lose that's important. You can't lose the presence of God if you're in Christ. You can't lose eternal joy and glory if you're in Christ. What can you lose? A little property, a little land, a little money. You have eternal riches. How about your anger? You ever think about this? Fascinating as you start to weave the characters and their actions in the story together. You ever grow angry with people? Presumptuous, self-confident? Christ doesn't walk away from you. He steps into that sin and he becomes your substitute for it. There is great hope in this passage. Though everybody in the story is, is, is rotten to David, David is still willing to step into their lives. How can David do that? Because David is willing to become a part, David is a part of his people. In the introduction, I mentioned that little town of Hickory, small basketball team who won that state title. At the end of the movie, when that team wins, ooh, I hope I didn't spoil that for you. But at the end of that movie, when the team wins, all the people from the school jump onto the court together. You know, we win, we win. For years, the, the, the little the school from Hickory can say, we won a championship, we won a championship. You didn't win a championship. You weren't on the team. You just went to the school. No, don't you understand? If our team won, we won. Our Savior won. David won. We win. We're together. It really is true what we're going to sing next. For my life is wholly bound to his. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing all is mine. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Let's pray. Father, we do need for you to deliver and protect and rescue and honor and save we thank you for the richness of this story, and we thank you for the steadfastness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And pray that we would sing with joy in our hearts and confidence. In Christ's name, amen.